Welcome to this YSL tutorial on creating basic flows in Power Automate. Here's what you'll learn during the tutorial. So we'll begin by getting started with Power Automate, logging on, finding it. We'll look at the importance of either using production or development environments to make sure you start off putting your flows in the right place. We'll create some basic flows, create some actions within them, including adding dynamic content fields. We'll look at how to test and run the flows you've created to check they work. We'll look at how you can save flows, add comments to them, and have a peek at them to see the underlying JSON, as it's called. And finally, we'll look at how you can copy flows and actions and also disable them, although we'll discover that you can't actually disable actions. So let's get started. The way I always choose to access Power Automate is by typing office.com, and that will take me to the 365 screen. I need to sign in. I'm acting as delegate 51 at wiseowlcourses.co.uk today and for most of this tutorial series, and I'll need to type in my password. Having done that, I can click on the sign in button and I'll choose to stay signed in. Now, in order to be able to use Power Automate, you'll need to have a 365 license. And for that, you'll need to pay, I believe it's about $10 a month to Microsoft. Sorry about that. You can then click on what's called the waffle, a rather strange name, that sees nine dots at the top left of the screen. And what that will allow you to do is to navigate between the various different cloud-based applications in 365. So I could, for example, click on the Microsoft 365 icon there or link there and see just the uh, Outlook, PowerPoint, Word and Excel. Or I could be more ambitious and choose to explore all of my apps, in which case I can then click on the All Apps link on the right hand side. And what I'll be able to do then is to see every single cloud-based app. And all of these, to a greater or lesser extent, support integration with Power Automate. But I don't want to do any of that. So what I'm going to do is click on the waffle and go to Power Automate. And that will allow me to create my first flows. It's probably worth mentioning, I could have short-circuited the whole process by just typing in powerautomate.com there and pressing return. And that will take me straight to it as well. So just before we look at creating flows, I want to mention the important subject of environments. At the top right of your screen, you can see which environment you're using, and you can click on the name of the environment to see your choices. I've got two, and so will you. The first environment in my case is the development environment. That's one that only I, Delegate 51, can see. And the second one is one which is shared amongst all the different people on the same domain, and there's 80 or 90 of those who are all the delegates on YSL training courses. So I want to make sure that I don't, because I'm a beginner with Power Automate, I'm just creating basic flows, that everything I create goes in my uh, development environment. So it's important to choose that at the beginning. The reason it's important is it's quite hard transferring information from one environment to another. They're both stored in different tenants on the Microsoft server. And so what you would end up having to do is to share an environment and then access it from another one. So it's easier to make the decision correctly in the first place. So it's time now to create our first flow. You can have a look at flows you've already created by clicking on My Flows on the left-hand side. And you can see I've been cheating, I'm afraid. I've created one called My Very First Flow earlier, 48 minutes ago, in fact. Um, what I'm now going to do is to create a new one. I can do that either by clicking on New Flow up there, or I can choose Create Flow on the left-hand side. I'm going to do the latter. They're both pretty much identical. I don't at the moment want to create a flow triggered by an event. So I'm not interested in it running when somebody clicks on an item in a SharePoint list or sends me an email or, or puts a file in my OneDrive. Instead, I'll choose an instant cloud flow. And that's what I recommend if you're first getting started. I'll give it a name. My flow is going to send an email to my good friend, Delegate52. So that's what I'm going to use as my flow name. I'll choose manually trigger a flow because I want to be able to run this just by clicking on a button. I don't want to have to depend on some other event. And I'll click on the create button to create this. It will do after a short pause is create my flow. And every flow has to have a trigger. In this case, the trigger is that I click on a button to manually run my flow. So there's always something which begins it. Everything which then follows is a sequence of actions which I can start by clicking on the new step button. 
So to add a step or an action, I can click on the new step button, obviously, and I can choose what I want to do. I can either choose one of the existing libraries of uh, actions, and there are many of them, or probably better, I can just type in what I want to do. So I want to send an email, so I'll type in send email. And what it will do is come up with a list of the possible actions meeting that criteria. You need to choose quite carefully. Some of these can look very similar to each other. What I want to do is to send an email using my Excel or rather Office 365 Outlook. Many of the actions have version numbers in brackets after them, which I just find confusing. Why not just show me the latest one and miss out the version numbers? If you want to see more on an action, you can click on the information symbol to the right hand side and then you can click on learn more and it will take you to a separate web page showing you all the parameters that this action takes. But I'm not going to do that at this stage. I'm just going to choose my action, send an email, and it will put in the parameters for me, which I can now fill in. So I'm sending it to my good friend Delegate52, as already mentioned. When I type that in, you can see it's coming up with a list of all the people on the same domain. The subject is going to be hello. And the body of the text is going to display uh, my username and the date. So I'm going to put in two placeholders for that. I can then position my mouse pointer where I want my username to go and use the dynamic content which appears down at the bottom right automatically to find my username. So I can type in my search string, click on the dynamic content I want to insert, which in this case is my username, and it will add in a field which will give my username. And I can do the same thing for the date. So I can position my mouse pointer where I want the date to go, type in the search string as date, choose date, and it will put that in for me. For any dynamic content, we're always that easy. And see, if you stay watching this series of tutorials, you'll find that that's not always the case, sadly. I've now finished my action, so I can click on the Save button, and my flow is ready to run. So my flow is telling me that while it's ready to go, it's recommending that I should test it. So that's what I'm going to do now. Over the top right hand button here is a button saying test. And what I'm going to do is click on that to see how my flow looks. So if I click on test, I can run a flow in one of two ways. Automatically will only apply if I have a trigger, which will make it run. But because I said I wanted to run it manually, I need to click on the first option instead. I can then click on the test button at the bottom to test my flow. What it will then do is analyze all the connections and all the permissions my flow needs in order to be able to run. And you can see there's only one of them. I'm trying to use Outlook and it tells me my permissions and gives me a green tick to show that I'm OK to go. If there aren't green ticks all the way down, you need to set permissions. I can now click on the continue button. And what I always make the mistake of doing now is thinking that's running my flow. It's not. It's taking me to the next stage where I can then click on the button yet again and actually run my flow. So you can see it says my flow run has successfully started. I actually think it's probably successfully finished as well if I click on done. And you can see I've got green text next to each of my actions. So what I, what I now want to do is see whether my flow has worked. What I've magically done is to create a separate tab for Delegate 52. And you can see there is my email. And sure enough, it contains my username and it contains today's date, 21st of August, 2023, in uh, international format. So that's good, my flow worked, I've tested it. I could, if I like, run it again. I could click on this button to go back to my flow. When I do that, you can see that it highlights all the times I've run my flow at the bottom down here. So you can see a history of all the runs. Now what I can do is click on the edit button, which takes me back into my flow. I never quite see why it doesn't take you straight to that. And I click on the test button again. Now at this point, I've got two options. I can either run it manually a second time, or I can click on automatically with a recently used trigger. And what that will do is list all the previous occasions on which I've run my flow. So what I could do is run at the previous occasion under identical circumstances, and it will actually give me identical results. So if I click on the test button, uh, it's already validated the permissions. It will send the email. And if I go over to my friend at Delegate51's email, you can see they've got a second copy of the same email. So that's how you can run 
uh, flows. So what I'm going to do now is to make a small change. I'm going to change the subject of my email to hello space 52. And then I'm going to attempt to list my flows on the left hand side. Now, when I do that, it will ask me, do you want to lose all the changes you've made since your last save? I don't. So I'll choose cancel to avoid leaving the page, then click on the save button to save that. Then I can click on my flows and it will have saved the change, not only to that action, but to the entire flow. I then want to comment my flow to make it easier to read. So what I'm going to do is go to my flow, click on the edit button, go into editing it, and then I will comment it and then add a notation to it. So to comment it, you can click on the three dots to the right of any action and you can choose to create a new comment. So this will start the flow, would be a reasonable comment to add in. And I can click on the rather surprising play button, which actually saves it. Comments are used primarily to send information to other people who may be using your flow to explain what it does. What you can also do rather more usefully, I think, is to rename and annotate flows. So for my second action saying send an email v2, what I could do is click on the three dots and choose to rename it. So I'll choose to say send email to 52 and then press return. And then what I can also do is click on the three dots and choose to add a notate or an annotation to it. And what that will do is add a section at the top of the flow always here where I can add in a short note. So what my short note is going to say is send email with username and date. And then when I finish that, I can click on save. And you can see the annotation appears at the top. I personally think they could have made this clearer to read. It's not obvious that that's an annotation and it doesn't really stand out, but it's still a useful feature. The other thing I was going to show you in this section is that you can peek at an action. And what does that mean? You can click on the three dots again and choose to peek code. And welcome to the real world of Power Automate. Everything in Power Automate is stored as JSON, JavaScript object notation files, which looks like this. I would love to be able to stand here or sit here and tell you that you never need to understand this and it's all hidden away from you. Sadly, that's not true. And the further you get into Power Automate, the more you'll need to understand some of this syntax. And that's probably my biggest gripe about Power Automate, that it's not quite as easy to use as it perhaps should be. But let's choose done for the moment. We certainly don't need to get into that. Yet. So what we're going to do now is look just towards the end of this topic at copying and disabling flows and actions. Let's return to the list of flows. Uh, if you want to disable a flow so you don't want it to be possible to run it, you can just click on the three dots to the right of the flow and you can choose to turn it off. And when you do that, you can see that the play button in a second will vanish. I have to move my mouse over to see that, uh, or at least be disabled. I can no longer run that flow. I can turn it back on again by choosing turn on. If I want to copy a flow, uh, there's no option to copy it. But what I can do instead is to save it with a different name. So if I call this copy of send an email to my good friend 52 and choose save, you can see it will create a copy of the same flow, which I can then edit independently. And one other thing it does is automatically disables that, it turns it off to avoid me accidentally creating a copy of a flow and then running it when I didn't intend to. So I could then, if I wanted to, turn it back on again. To delete a flow, by the way, you just select it and click on the three dots and then choose to delete it. What is really puzzling, just confirm that, is that you can't delete multiple actions. I have tried many ways to see if you can do it. It seems to be completely impossible. So if you built up a list of 20 or 30 flows and want to delete them all, you have to do it individually. I've even tried writing a Power Automate flow to delete my Power Automate flows, but that seemed a bit self-referential. So that's how you can work with disabling and copying uh, flows. If you want now to do the same thing for an individual action, you have to go into edit it. And you can copy an individual action as follows. So let's suppose I want to send this email to two different people. So I'll create a copy of the uh, action and then tweak it slightly. This is not quite as straightforward as you might think. I can right click and choose to copy it to my clipboard. I can create a new step. And for my new step, I can click 
on the My Clipboard tab. It's not obvious remembering how to do this. And then I can choose one of the actions I put in my clipboard recently. So I've copied it twice, actually. I'll paste that in. And then I could, if I like, go in and edit this. There's another slight feature about this which makes it less than optimal, which is if you've created variables in an action, it's possible to create duplicates of the variables in the copied action, which stops your entire flow working. But that's possibly a subject for a later day. So that's how you can copy an action. I'll just delete that. How do you disable it? How do you say, actually, I want that to keep that in my flow, but not, not, not have it actually do anything? Well, to do that, you click on the three dots and you can't do it. Uh, this annoys me slightly. It would be called commenting out in most applications. You can do it in Power Automate Desktop and do it in most, most programming languages. But there doesn't seem to be any way to do this. The best you can do is actually delete it or copy it to the clipboard and then delete it. Uh, possibly with a view to reinstating it at a later stage. But that always bugs me slightly. With that slight winch, we've created our first flow.